Hi, um, good afternoon. My presentation today is drawn from the research published by Catherine Footer and myself in our catalog essay. Um, we were thrilled to be um, invited uh, to participate in this opportunity and be part of this exhibition. And we acknowledge with gratitude the significant groundwork already laid on the subject of Gorham's marketing and distribution methods by Charles Carpenter and Charles Venable as well as Elizabeth Williams and Emily Bannis' monumental efforts to digitize so much of the Gorham archive for us to use remotely. The high level of creativity and innovation in Gorham silverwares also pervaded the firm's strategies for marketing and selling their wares domestically and abroad. As an artistic firm established at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, Gorham was among the pioneers who developed a new and evolving focus on advertising and market expansion, which entailed the establishment of a vast sales force and network of distributors, brick and mortar retail and wholesale venues, the publication and circulation of printed catalogs, multimedia advertising campaigns, and participation in regional, national, and international exhibitions and world fairs. In this presentation, we'll look briefly at this five-prong approach and how these strategies grew um, and evolved during the firm's lifespan. In its earliest days, this building at 12 Steeple Street was where Jabez Gorham and his son John and their first partners manufactured and sold their wares to independent peddlers. In 1819, Jabez went on his earliest unaccompanied sales trip to towns in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Vermont, but barely sold enough to cover his costs. However, as his son John worked to increase production on a monumental scale with the goal of selling Gorham far and wide across the country, he began to develop a national network of traveling salesmen. Initially, these men were assigned to the East Coast, the Midwest, the West Coast, and by the beginning of the Civil War to Canada. Covering miles and miles, these peddlers carried photographs and examples of representative work for consideration of retail jewelry store owners. Notably, Gorham was the first American silver manufacturer to utilize industrial photography beginning in the mid-1850s. A full photography department was established by early 1860 and remained a necessary part of Gorham's operation. Once a new piece was completed, it was photographed and the proofs were distributed to the traveling salesmen who would gauge the public's interest and take designs and take orders for these designs. Time was money and the firm was loath to waste time as they said groping for what held appeal and interest. It was also during this time that the company had began to develop a network of retailers and agents ranging from the Shreve and, from Shreve & Co. in San Francisco, who retailed this decanter set, to William Wilson McGrew in Cincinnati, who gave Gorham's Hiawatha boat centerpiece star billing at, the boot, at his booth at the 1872 Cincinnati Industrial Exposition. As was true in other growing American cities, while firms in Cincinnati were manufacturing their own silver, they were also filling out their stock with wares by Gorham. In 1856, Gorham ventured into the retail business for the first time when it joined Henry T. Brown to establish Gorham Co. and Brown. Under Brown's management, the store, located on Westminster Street, sold Gorham silver and other goods directly to the public. public. In fact, we know from John Gorham's diary that when he went to Paris in 1860, he purchased porcelains, bronzes, prints, ivories, opera glasses, and microscopes to supplement the stock at the store. Desiring to expand beyond Providence, in 1859, Gorham opened a wholesale office in New York City at 4 Maiden Lane. 
This location was set in the jewelry district of Lower Manhattan, a must stop for silver retailers visiting from across the country to replenish their stock. Gorham's success on Maiden Lane is evident in the recollection that on Christmas morning, 1864, only $7 of stock remained out of an average of $10,000 stock they kept on hand. In 1871, Gorham relocated to the Waltham Building on Bond Street, a location further uptown where many of the New York of many where many of New York's other luxury retailers had established stores. There they shared the first floor with Taylor, Olmsted, and Taylor, importers of fancy goods. For the first two years, Gorham operated a wholesale only establishment here. Historically, they had relied on others such as Howard, Starr and Marcus, and Tiffany and Co to sell their wares to the New York public. However, increased production, coupled with Tiffany's decision to sell only its own silver designs, pushed Gorham into the New York retail market. Soon, they were advertising that in their Bond Street rooms, the largest and richest stock ever shown in New York could be shopped by visitors. Their 1874 display in December offered goods at a variety of price points, from the Cellini Salver, valued at $2,500, that's about $55,500 in today's money, uh, to small articles, priced as low as $5 or $3, or $111 to $67 today. On May 8, 1876, Gorham opened a new expanded retail store at 37 Union Square. Union Square was an important Manhattan crossroads and commercial center. With this retail opening, the Bond Street location returned to wholesale activities. This move increased the proximity of Gorham's retail business to its wealthy clientele and to its rival, Tiffany, who had maintained a presence in Union Square since 1870. Upon opening, wares prepared but not completed in time for the Philadelphia 1876 centennial were shown here along with more typical stock wares. During the 19th century, national and international expositions became a chief marketing tool for manufacturers and Gorham used them to their full advantage. Even before, Gorman, even before John Gorham's 1852 visit to the remnants of the 1851 World's Fair in London, Gorham had been participating in regional fairs such as the 1851 Rhode Island State Fair. There, the firm, then known as Gorham and Thurber, exhibited a chinoiserie tea set that represented its most elaborate hollowware to date. The hot water kettle is illustrated in this 1852 advertisement, and although, lo although the location of the original tea set is not known, it bore striking uh, re resemblance to the chinoiserie set that is up in the exhibition and now um, in the collection of the Art Institute of Chicago. Also shown in the advertisement, in reverse, is the Rebecca at the Well picture, now at the Cincinnati Art Museum and also on view upstairs. At the 1851 Rhode Island State Fair, Gorham won the highest prize, quote, in the graceful arts, and were praised for their new and elegant designs and high degree of craftsmanship. Gorham gained its largest audience to date, at the 1876 Philadelphia Centennial. Although there were other American producers of silver and silver plate who participated, Tiffany and Company, Meriden Britannia Company, and C. Rogers and Company, Gorham was by far the most well-established of the group and widely acclaimed as the clear front runner. One report stated, quote, if Gorham registered the number of visitors to its stall in the rotunda of the central transept, we suspect the footing up would reach several millions. Mounted during an economic depression, Gorham's display included pieces that the firm had already fabricated. And this was something that was easily considered when the circulation of images was much more limited than it is today. 
Older pieces that were shown included Hiawatha's boat, um, depicting a scene from Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha, made in 1871 and previously seen at the 1872 Cincinnati Industrial Exposition. It was purchased out of the 1876 fair by um, Mrs. Ulysses S. Grant and remains part of the White House collection today. Gorham also displayed pieces from the Ferber service, such as this large epern made in 1872. Here you can see both Hiawatha's boat to the right and the Ferber epern at the center, as well as the standout of the exhibition, a piece created specifically for the fair, the century vase seen through the doorway of the pavilion. Over four feet tall and five feet wide, it contained 2,000 ounces of silver and was priced at $25,000. For those who were not able to view the century vase at the fair, word about it and Gorham's capabilities were published in a photo illustrated brochure in 1876. And a second brochure on the vase was published in 1878. And it was also exhibited at the 1889 Paris and 1893 Chicago World's Fairs. Sadly, the vase was melted down in the 1930s. As we've already witnessed in the 1851 advertisement that included illustrations of the Rebecca at the Well picture and the Chinoiserie tea set, Gorham utilized print advertisements quite early. This example, published in Boston's American Advertiser in 1853, also illustrates a wide variety of the firm's designs. And it declares, quote, testimonials in silver, very richly embellished, with appropriate designs to order at short notice. Along with touting products, Gorham also advertised their prowess, noting that they were the largest silver manufacturer in the world, creating original designs using the latest machines and methods, and employing highly trained talents called from Europe and England. After winning prizes at the international exhibitions, they routinely took out full page advertisements to announce and highlight their achievements. They also harnessed the circulation and power of general interest magazines. In 1868, a 15-page article in Harper's New Monthly Magazine focused on silver and silver plate and was completely illustrated with Gorham objects. You'll see the Ferber bowl um, illustrated there prominently. A similar article placed in Scribner's Monthly ran in 1875. Under the leadership of Edward Holbrook, the company continued to build on the sales and promotion work of John Gorham. Holbrook made it his mission to increase sales volume and the prestige of the firm across the globe, and he did. In fact, at the time of his death in 1919, he was credited with advancing Gorham from the position of being one of many concerns to one of the most important leaders in the world silverware trade. During the 1880s and 1890s, more silver was being produced than ever before in the US. And this increase meant a rise in competition and product to sell. Gorham, like its competitors, enlarged its sales force, which could now, thanks to the railroad, travel easier, cheaper, faster, and further. Advances in affordability in printing made it possible to produce more advertisements and trade catalogs and a surge in sales and more financial flexibility allowed for the establishment of large, ostentatious showrooms and more over-the-top displays at, monu at international fairs. In 1884, Gorham established a new New York headquarters for wholesale and retail at 19th and Broadway. Designed by Edward Kendall in the old Dutch style, their new building stood prominently in the fashionable Ladies Mile shopping district. Gorham occupied the basement and the first and the second floors. Note the large display windows. In December 1884, issues of Art Amateur, um, ex excuse me, in the December 1884 issue of Art Amateur, these windows were cited for their presentation of quote, 
marvis, marvelously good specimens of bronze and oxidized silver in the Japanese taste. Passing through the mahogany doors with beveled French glass, one entered the retail area of the showroom, featuring long, horseshoe-shaped cases filled with silver. The building had Edison lights, and the New York Times warned, quote, the glitter of silver on each floor is ruinous to weak eyes. <laughs> kind of like the exhibition upstairs. <laughs> upstairs, um, in the showroom, accessible by elevator or by staircase in the back of the building, space was devoted to whole, the wholesale business. The basement served as the stock room, and eventually the firm took over the third and fourth floors as well. By 1894, art rooms for the display of the firm's most impressive silver, arranged as they would appear in a home, opened on the third floor. By the early 1890s, 177 clerks were employed here, in comparison to a mere 120 salespeople employed by Tiffany at their New York flagship. <laughs> While business flourished in New York, Gorham also maintained and established wholesale offices in San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, Paris, and London. Gorham published its first trade catalogs in 1880, and by this time, most of the other silver manufacturers were also producing catalogs of this type. Featuring richly detailed engravings and lithographs, Gorham's catalog often boasted hundreds of pages depicting thousands of items, often illustrated to scale. Usually published in autumn to anticipate holiday shopping, these catalogs were intended for wholesalers and retailers, not individual customers. Prices were not printed in the catalogs, but were available separately in price lists, and this avoided the need to reprint the catalogs when prices changed, and if it afforded some discretion to shop owners who might let shoppers browse the catalog. Um, a separate price list kept the wholesale price and the seller's profit margin confidential. Included in, a, in the catalog, there was nearly always an update on the superiority, achievements, and positive state of the company. The 1902 catalog featured a richly illustrated frontispiece celebrating the firm's receipt of the Grand Prix at the 1900 Exposition Universelle in Paris. And the 1904 catalog included images of the firm's pavilion at the World's Fair in St. Louis in addition to a list of the awards and honors they received there and at previous world fairs in which they participated. Catalogs of all sizes, general and more specialized, were produced into the 1980s, featuring slick images of Gorham products with customer enticing narratives. They remained a very important element in the company's marketing effort. Although Gorham did not participate in the 1878 Paris Exposition Univers Universelle during, due to the economic depression, Gorham was aggressive about displaying at the following World's Fairs. In, it participated in the Sydney International Exhibition of 1879 and 80, and the 1889 Paris Exposition Universelle, where the firm received a gold medal for its silverware. Five other American silver firms displayed their wares in 1889 at Paris, but it was Gorham who received the most attention and critical praise. One visitor wrote about Gorham's display, quote, it is impossible to see a greater variety of silver articles in the Paris exhibition. I could go on indefinitely describing tea sets, punch bowls, tureens, etc., all in different style and decoration. Indeed, Gorham's display included Saracenic, Japanese, Louis XVI, and Greek-inspired designs. But its Oriental East Indian wares, a great example seen here, attracted the most attention. In 1893, at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, the American Silverware Pavilion was jointly funded by Gorham, Tiffany & Co., and Tiffany Glass and Decorating Company. 
an arrangement resulting because the American government would not financially support the enterprise. The elaborate pavilion featured on its facade a fan of American flags and was surmounted by a 100-foot monumental column capped with a golden eagle atop a terrestrial, terrestrial globe. So this made it very easy to find them at the fair. <laughs> Gorham and Tiffany had separate entrances. Gorham's side of the pavilion boasted a paneled ceiling with lunettes painted by Charles Frederick Nagil and medallions with portraits of great silversmiths and designers such as Paul Revere, Michelangelo, and Albert Durer. A bounty of new works were shown, including a six-foot-tall silver figure of Christopher Columbus designed by Frederick Bartholdi, artist of the Statue of Liberty. The world's largest silver sculpture, Columbus was made in one pour and contained more than a ton of silver at a cost of $25,000. Although Gorham exhibited works previously produced, like the Century Vase, new works took center stage. Among these were the Nautilus centerpiece at left, a fantastic yachting trophy designed specifically uh, for the fair by William Christmas Codman, which David uh, discussed at length, and this claret jug, now in the collection of the MFA Boston, which was also, and this claret jug was also shown at the fair. It showcased Gorham's collaboration with the American glass firm, such as J. Hoare and Company and T.J. Hawks and Company, both of Corning, New York. Here, a baluster-shaped glass form is embellished with silver gilt mounts amethysts, garnets, and moonstones. Gorham received 45 awards at the fair and loads of positive press. After the fair, an exhibition of award-winning works was held in New York at Grand Central Palace. Gorham's wares were featured there prominently. All of this, as you can imagine, increased the firm's standing and their notoriety. This increase in worldwide attention directed to Gorham was furthered through the introduction of the Martelet line, initially debuted in an exhibition at the Waldorf Astoria in New York in 1897 and officially introduced to the world at the Paris 1900 Exposition. This dressing table and stool was at the center of Gorham's fair display in Paris. Designed by William Christmas Codman, it was executed by a team of silversmiths who employed over 78 pounds of silver and labored more than 2,300 hours. Codman won the gold medal, and Edward Holbrook was made a chevalier of the French Legion of Honor. Gorham took home the grand prize for metalwork, and the British press noted the firm had no superiors on either side of the Atlantic. Gorham went on to participate and win honors in the 1901 American Exhibition in Buffalo and at the 1902 First International Exposition of Modern Decorative Arts in Turin. In their displays and advertising, Gorham emphasized that each example of Martelet was a unique work of art created by talented artist craftsmen. In 1904, at the Louisiana Purchase Exhibition in St. Louis, Gorham again received the highest honors, grand prize for silverware and goldware, jewelry, bronze work, leather work, and for applied arts. This time, a writing table, another writing table, or this time a writing table and a chair designed by William Christmas Codman stood at the centerpiece of the display. Most of the works featured were created special for the fair, including this centerpiece in the Cincinnati Art Museum's collection. Gorham also exhibited a complete dinner service in the Florentine line, works in gold, including a 20-piece toilette set, and works from the Athenic line. While winning over audiences and consumers at the world's fairs, Gorham continued to develop a more strategic approach to selling its wares abroad. Access to Paris and other European cities came through Gorham's Chicago affiliate, Spalding & Co., which had maintained a shop in Paris since 1889 and was very well connected to the continent's royal families and social elite. 
In 1901 and 1902, the firm explored business opportunities in South Africa. Sales there were so promising that they opened a wholesale office in London in 1904 to sell to the UK. Gorham made a bold move in 1930 when it hired American photographer Edward Steichen, known for his highly stylized fashion photography for Condé Nast's Vogue and Vanity Fair, as well as his work for New York advertising agencies. Steichen created a series of avant-garde images featuring Gorham's streamlined, but not overtly modern, Fairfax pattern. These images were used to promote the pattern's moderately priced, quote, elegance and simplicity that, quote, harmonizes with the decoration of most dining rooms. His straightforward yet stylish layout of the flatware suggested efficiency for a fast-paced world unwilling to sacrifice taste especially in economically challenging times. The inclusion of Steichen's photograph in Gorham's advertising campaign speaks to the firm's efforts to retain the relevancy of their creations in the constantly changing interests and status of their consumers. As time moved forward, there was also a systematic modernizing of store decor and window displays to keep up with the latest fashions. This is especially well illustrated in the 1940 renovation of the firm's Providence showrooms, located at the company's headquarters adjacent to its executive offices. The room boasted a light, elegant, modern air in the combination of clean lines, walnut and butternut woodwork, and a taupe blue-green and peach palette. Gorham retailers were encouraged to visit the new interiors to see modern ideas in lighting, superb settings for silver, and suggestions for promotion they could use in their own stores. It was not until the New York World's Fair of 1939-40 that Gorham would participate again in an international exhibition of any magnitude. There, Gorham joined Tiffany & Co. in a pavilion titled the House of Jewels. Their modernist pavilion was designed by architect J. Gordon Carr and Raymond Lowy. Gorm displayed a few works in the Art Deco style, but most of their wares on display were in a more conservative historical mode. Tiffany's wares were much more au courant. Marketing and sales of silver came to a near halt with the advent of World War II and the manufacturing limits set by the War Production Board. Gorham's hollowware production was reduced by 70%, and only their top 13 flatware patterns remained available. In fact, they were forced to ration their silver among their network of retailers. Following the war, most Americans sought simpler, more casual lifestyles that generally did not include silver. Although some brides still registered for silver patterns, Five-piece place settings replaced the countless specialized utensils required at those 19th century meals. The sale of stainless steel flatware, usurped sterling, and new materials such as plastic, aluminum, and chrome began to replace silver in the fabrication of dishes, trays, utensils, and other household items. Retailers like Black, Star, and Gorham remained hopeful, stating, quote, Young couples may start their married life with stainless, but it is less expensive because it is less expensive. However, after four or five years of living with only stainless, they will buy sterling. But despite this sentiment, the recruitment of up-and-coming designers such as Coleflesh, who were charged with infusing contemporary designs into Gorham's products, and extensive advertising campaigns and promotion. Gorham Silver never regained its former stature. Not even giant baby cradling spoons could revive the excitement for sterling. Um, the four-foot spoon, which we've seen several times today, is of course um, was a was produced as a traveling promotion and um, is in the Melrose pattern. Part of Gorham's temporary recovery after its 1921 bankruptcy included the eventual closure of all of its company-run retail stores. Gorham's principal business was the manufacture of silver for retailers, and the firm's own retail stores were competing with those other retailers. Of its wholesale offices, the New York branch was the only to remain open during World War II. 
department stores increasingly served as the best spots for Gorham's promotional displays. However, despite their production of new patterns and designs and the company's attempt to sell them through smart advertising and marketing, American lifestyles had changed. More modern materials and conveniences such as aluminum and dishwashers were simply more desirable and this spelled the end for one of America's greatest manufacturers. Thank you.